So hello everyone, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Konrad Kucharski and uh, this is my first speech at Digital Dragons. Uh, so today I want to tell you about Quest system which we developed for Dying Light 2. And it's really difficult to compress over uh, three years of work into 40 minutes presentation. Uh, so I will focus only on the main ideas and main solutions uh, of our system. Uh, yeah, I want to focus on three challenges we had to overcome during the development, and they are uh, how to create a system uh, which could support a nonlinear story, and how to make it work in a co op game. And finally, I will tell you how, how our system uh, deals with uh, the streaming of the world. Uh, I will start with a short, short introduction. Uh, I want to tell you about the problems we had previously, and uh, I want to tell you about the decision uh, to create a completely new one. Uh, three main parts of this presentation are a reflection of these challenges I told you about. Uh, the most important uh, is the second part, which is about uh, execution, uh, because this is the place where we created something uh, new and something uh, really unique. And there will be a Q&A session at the end, so if you have any questions, uh, please wait until the end. Okay, a uh, couple words about me. Uh, so, currently I'm a senior game programmer at Techland, uh, working, working there uh, for the last 10 years. Uh, I started as a tools programmer, but at the beginning of Dying Light 1 production, I was moved to one of teams uh, which was responsible for our previous quest system. And somehow I stick to that topic for the next seven years. So uh, currently I'm responsible for the whole system, uh, but I'm also involved in uh, development of two other systems uh, related to narration, a uh, system of dialogues and movies. Okay, uh, so a couple of months after we shipped Dying Light, uh, our game director came to us uh, to tell his ideas uh, for Dying Light 2. Uh, so he wanted to give players not only the freedom uh, of movement as it was uh, with the parkour in Dying Light 1, uh, but he also wanted to give players the freedom in terms of story. Uh, he wanted to create what he called a uh, narrative sandbox. And that new pillar of Dying Light 2 design uh, was named Choices and Consequences. Uh, so I was really happy about the decision uh, because it meant that we'll have to create a completely new system and for a long time I really wanted to do it. Uh, this is a moment when I want to ask you a very uh, simple question. Have you played Dying Light 1? If you have, please raise your hand. Wow. Uh, so perhaps there is someone in the audience who knows the answer to this question. How many choices were in Dying Light 1? Yeah, a uh, very good answer. Uh, unfortunately, not the correct answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, there was one choice at the very end of the very last expansion, and the game ended like in five minutes after that choice. And uh, many people forgot about it, even developers. Uh, but I still remember because I had to hard code it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it took me about three days to make it work right, uh, because basically our previous system was uh, created for linear story, and uh, yeah, if there was a branch, uh, two alternative paths, the system would follow both paths at the same time. So we had choices, but without any consequences. In our previous system, quests were connected with each other in the form of a tree, and quests themselves were pretty much a sequence of things that players should do, or a sequence of changes which should happen to the world. Okay, so we knew that we have to create a new system. So we started with over uh, three months of research and design. Uh, our main references at the time were uh, Fallout New Vegas and Witcher 2, mainly because editors from these games were publicly available at that time. And uh, pretty quickly, we've decided that we want to have a graphical form of quest representation. Uh, so yeah, we experimented a lot. Uh, we tried uh, to create uh, vertical uh, graphs. We tried uh, to represent uh, qu 
request uh, as a horizontal graphs. We tried you know many different ways. Um, well, something is happening. So usually we don't spend that much time on design, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but this time we went all the way. Uh, we did everything in paper. Uh, we prepared uh, multiple uh, UML diagrams for the whole system. Uh, we even estimated the amount of data we will need to send through network in the co-op game. And uh, we did all of it uh, well before the first line of code. And uh, it really paid off. OK, so now the first part of the presentation. Uh, which is about quest structure. Uh, possibly it was the easiest part uh, because we didn't have to, you know, reinvent, reinvent the wheel here. Uh, so as I told you, uh, we wanted a graphical form of quest representation. Uh, we wanted graphs, and at the time, uh, editor uh, from Unreal Engine Blueprints was the the best graph editor available. Um, so we wanted to create something similar. Uh, results you can see here. And the uh, funny thing is that our level designers uh, were familiar with that technology, so automatically they become you know, familiar with our tools. And they very often tell me that uh, our tools are very intuitive. Uh, for some time, uh, we thought about cycles in graphs. Uh, we definitely wanted at least replayable parts of quests. Uh, but after some time, we decided that uh, cycles uh, will be too problematic to handle them properly, especially in the co-op game. Uh, so instead, we've decided to create a directed acyclic graph. Uh, important thing here is that we don't use any additional scripting languages. Uh, yeah, that graph is everything we have. Uh, our main building blocks are called quest logics. Previously, they were called phases, so I might use both names. Uh, yeah, They are supposed to be simple classes. Uh, each logic should serve single purpose. And usually, I split them into uh, two categories, uh, tasks and actions. So uh, tasks are things that players should do, and they simply wait until a certain property of the world reaches the certain state, like uh, kill will wait until uh, certain NPC reaches the state of being dead. Uh, actions, on the other hand, are supposed to modify the world. They execute during a single frame and they just finish themselves. Uh, third group uh, is the smallest one, uh, but is very important. Uh, it consists of logic gates, which are uh, used to control the flow uh, of graph execution. Uh, I think at that time, uh, we have over 150 uh, different types of logics. Uh, yeah. So uh, we wanted to create a hierarchy of graphs. Uh, one big flat graph would be you know, unmanageable. Uh, we created uh, several strict rules. Uh, what can be placed in each layer? Uh, so the top layer consists of only one uh, logic, which is campaign logic, and you can't see it in our editor, uh, it is hidden. And uh, campaign contains the graph of quests, uh, that's the, the one with uh, blue logics. And you can place only quests there. Uh, everything, everything else must be stored on the lower layers. Uh, yeah. At the beginning I was against uh, such strict rules, uh, I wanted to have uh, logic gates at the level of quests, but in the end, I think uh, it made um, our quests much more readable. Yeah. Okay, uh, most of the time we create uh, choices with uh, alternative paths, uh, so this is why graphs are a great way to represent choices. Uh, here you have a simple example uh, of two choices. Uh, one is the peaceful one, which can be completed with the dialogue, and the second one can be completed uh, through combat. Uh, each choices are connected to logic gate, uh, which waits for the first signal, and on reaction to that signal, it cancels the execution of the remaining paths. Uh, so this is a simple example, but... Uh, you know. yeah. uh, consequences. 
So sometimes consequences uh, will not uh, take place immediately. Uh, sometimes they will take place much further in the story. Uh, so in such cases, we need to remember that certain that certain thing happened, and we use uh, quest variables to do that. Uh, this is a very common mechanism in games uh, with nonlinear story. Uh, so the idea is simple. Uh, if you want to remember something, you assign new value to variable. And later you can uh, ask about it, for example, with if variable logic, which will redirect the signal uh, in the graph. Uh, very obvious and interesting uh, way of making choices is through dialogues. So dialogues are represented in our graph uh, as a single logic. And the problem with dialogue is that they can't modify the world. Uh, that's the privilege of quests. Uh, so if there is a meaningful choice in the dialogue, uh, which should have a persistent, you know, uh, which should introduce persistent changes to the world. Uh, so, in such cases, dialogues create additional outputs. One output uh, represents uh, a single choice, and uh, dialogue notifies quest by sending signal to such output, and all the persistent changes are made on the side of quests uh, from the logics which are connected to these outputs. Okay, so that was the structure. Uh, we've created, directed a cyclic graph uh, which is hierarchical. Uh, we split it into multiple layers. Uh, we don't use any additional scripting languages. Yeah, we create choices with alternative paths, and we use variables to store decisions made by player. Okay, that will be fun. Uh, so before I tell you how uh, quests work in Dying Light 2, you, you need to understand how they worked previously. Uh, this is very important. Uh, so our quests could only progress forward. Uh, we started from a root node and we slowly progressed until we reached all the leaf nodes. And uh, such way of execution is also present in our new system. Uh, we used a very important uh, property of a tree, that there is only one path which connects each node in a tree with the root, and we used it to make jumps uh, to you know, any quest uh, in the story. We did, we did uh, these jumps uh, by simply simulating everything uh, on a path which connects the root with uh, that quest. And uh, we called that feature uh, invokes, and it was a really great way to uh, test our game. Uh, but we also used it in saves and in co-op games. Uh, simply, when we saved the game, uh, we serialized only the list of active nodes. And when we wanted to load the game, we performed a series of invokes to these nodes uh, which were previously active. Uh, it was really efficient way uh, to do it, especially in the co-op game, but it brought us a whole new category of problems. So, I have encountered such problem uh, over six years ago. Uh, so, someone reported me that uh, there is a problem with a guy named Brecken. Uh, so, Brecken is a leader of the first hub players encounters uh, in Dying Light 1. And at the beginning, he's on some kind of a mission. Uh, and after the prologue, a player is supposed to go and talk with him. Uh, so he was controlled with three logics, hide uh, in a small side quest, and show and talk, uh, which were located after the prologue. So during the normal gameplay, everything went fine. You know, the order of execution was hide, show, and talk. But problems appeared when we wanted to load the game. Uh, so, as I told you, we performed a series of invokes, but we had no knowledge in which order these invokes should be performed. So, in the result, the order was wrong. First was show, then was talk, and height was the last one. And in the result, Brecken was missing and it was impossible to talk with him. So, 
we solved that problem uh, by removing all uh, what we called parallel changes. So basically, all logics which modified a single object had to create a straight line. Yeah, sounds like a simple solution, um, but in reality it was very hard to do. And I must admit there were cases that we were not able to fix even in the released game. Uh, I, I only verified that they won't cause any you know, real problems. Uh, we had a long, long struggle uh, with these problems, and it led us to the main idea behind the execution of quests in Dying Light 2. So let's move on to Dying Light 2. Uh, I will no longer talk about trees. We will be in the, realms, uh, in the realm of graphs. Okay, uh, let's start with single logic. Uh, so logic starts in upcoming state. Uh, it is idle in that state, and when it, when it receives the first signal, it becomes active. Uh, logic is informed about that fact with onenterer callback. Uh, most of logics uh, execute most of its code uh, exactly in that callback. Uh, when logic is active, it receives update each frame, and uh, from that state it can either decide to finish itself and become completed, or it can uh, be cancelled by another logic and become cancelled. Either way, it will be notified about that fact with onLeave callback. Uh, whole execution is managed by the manager called executor. Uh, it is responsible for calling on execute on uh, each logic once per frame. And uh, yeah, logic can decide about two things from on execute. It can uh, send signals to one or multiple of its outputs, or it can uh, decide to finish itself. Either way, uh, it returns the result in the form of a simple structure. And this is really crucial that logic is not calling anything uh, on its own from on execute. And the reason will become apparent in a minute. Okay, uh, this is my favorite on execute. It's from if expression logic. Uh, it simply evaluates the Boolean value of certain expression and it sends a signal to one of its outputs, either true or false. Okay, now the most important slide, the next one. So when executor receives the result, uh, it analyzes the graph and it converts the result into a series of callbacks which should be called on proper logics. But instead of calling these callbacks uh, by itself, uh, which would be a great uh, waste of potential, it creates entries in a structure called the call stack. So call stack is our history of graph execution. Each entry represents single callback which should be called on a single logic. Uh, when we push new entries, they automatically uh, call the callbacks on, on, on proper logics. But the great thing is that we can do it multiple times. For example, we can serialize our call stack uh, into game saves. We can later deserialize it, recreate call stack, and reapply it by calling all these callbacks in the right order. And in the result, uh, our quests uh, restore the, exactly the same state as was uh, during the original gameplay. So this way uh, we solved both execution and game saves with a single solution. But there is potential for more. Uh, so this is exactly how we did our uh, replication in co-op game. We use call stack for that. Uh, so in COP, one player uh, serves the role of the master, and master is the one who can modify the call stack. Uh, so master sends his own call stack to all peers, and they reapply it uh, to their own quests, and uh, in result, the, the state is synchronized between all players. It doesn't mean that uh, peers are not able to uh, simulate quests on their own, because that would be really no fun for all these players. Uh, so instead, they simulate quests on their own, uh, but they don't modify the call stack. Uh, they send the meaningful execution results back to master. 
and master tries to apply them uh, into his own call stack. If master receives uh, two results which are conflicted with each other, he can decide uh, which one should be applied and uh, which one should be rejected. Uh, he modifies his own call stack and sends it back uh, to all peers. The cycle is completed. Yeah. And finally, call stack is our way to debug quests. Uh, so we can connect uh, from the editor through network to, to the game and synchronize call stacks. And uh, that way we can you know, watch quest execution in real time. Uh, we use colors to uh, show the, the state of logics. Uh, for example, yellow uh, represents active, uh, green is completed, etc. On the right side, uh, you can see actual call stack. Uh, great thing of call stack is that you can go to any point in the past and you can see what was the state of the graph uh, in exactly that moment. And then you can slowly uh, go step by step and watch uh, how uh, signals went through the whole graph. Yeah, this is a really uh, great way to, to debug quests and most of the time uh, we can solve our problems without the necessity to use you know, Visual Studio, for example. Okay, um, until now I told you only about uh, two callbacks on enters and on executes and uh, for some time uh, we thought that we could create the whole history only of these two callbacks, uh, but unfortunately we are not able to um, correctly restore uh, state of quests. Uh, we lacked two pieces of inf information. Uh, we needed order in which signals were received and order in which signals were sent from logics. And normally uh, these two events are represented uh, by on input and on output callbacks. So we had to add them uh, to our call stack. It was a difficult uh, decision because it meant that we at least doubled the size of call stack, which was already big. Okay, uh, so this is the final list of our callbacks. We have on execute, which is the brain of logic. And the uh, yeah, important thing is that logic can't modify anything from on execute because it has no representation in the call stack, so all the changes uh, would be lost, in, for example, during the loading. And then we have four callbacks uh, representing uh, four important events uh, which can happen to logic. And I told you that we wanted to have at least replayable quests. Uh, we didn't want to, to add cycles because cycles would you know, boost the size of call stack into infinity. Uh, so instead we, turned, uh, we transformed our call stack into a giant undo stack. Just imagine you can press Ctrl Z in the game and you know, reverse the, the progress of quests. Uh, so we did that by adding four additional callbacks, the mirror ones. Uh, they are supposed to revert all the changes uh, made by their counterparts. Uh, this is a pretty long list, but uh, usually you don't have to implement all of these methods. Uh, most of the time, logics implement only two of them on enter and on execute. Okay, uh, this is a very simple example of rollbackable logic. Uh, it's set variable. Uh, when we move forward, uh, it stores the previous value of variable and it uh, sets the new one. And when we are making rollback, uh, it simply restores the, the, the previous value. Okay, so that was execution. Uh, the most important thing is that we have one solution which handles all of our needs. Uh, whole execution is based on call stack and everything happens in these callbacks. Uh, this is a very deterministic way uh, to simulate quests and it is reversible. And yeah, there is one catch. So when we ship the game, uh, players will play the game, they will make saves. Uh, so they will generate a lot of call stacks. And we will have to patch the game and definitely we will need to modify quests. Uh, so as you can imagine, those call stacks will no longer fit to new quest structure. And this is a really big problem, uh, the biggest problem of the whole system. Uh, 
So in such cases, uh, we need to patch this call stack. And we need to remove all entries which are no longer valid. We need to generate completely new entries to fill the gaps. And yeah, it can be done, but it is really a non-trivial task. Okay. So the last part, uh, which will be pretty short, uh, I will talk about the interaction between quests and the world. Uh, so world of the game was probably the second reason why we had to um, rework our quest system. Uh, so previously, our game was split into multiple levels. Uh, we had two big ones and multiple smaller ones. And only one level could be loaded at uh, any given time and also quests from that level uh, were simulated uh, on, the, on, on the same time. So it was really big limitation, and in uh, Dying Light 2, we wanted to simulate all quests from all uh, maps at the same time. Yeah. So in Dying Light 2, the uh, situation is completely different, and now we don't have multiple levels, we have only one, but really giant one. Uh, and we introduced uh, the streaming of the world, uh, which we call spawning, so I will use that name instead. Uh, so with spawning, uh, objects exist only uh, in certain range around the player, and everything uh, outside is either missing or changed into LOD. Uh, yeah. So the, the big problem is to determine the, the state of objects which are despawned. Uh, quests need that information in order to progress forward, and objects themselves uh, need this information to correctly restore its state. Yeah, We could have saved uh, the state of the whole world, uh, but that would not work in the co-op game. Um, it would probably take a large amount of data, and it would not be feasible to send it through network. Uh, so instead, uh, we took a different approach, uh, we've decided that uh, our objects should always be, well, the state of these objects should always be a result of state of quests. So that way we only need to synchronize uh, quest, quests uh, between players and, yeah, in the result objects will synchronize automatically. <coughs> Uh, we needed a place uh, to store at least temporary uh, state of all objects, especially the despawned ones. Uh, so we've created a middleman between quests and the world, and we call that middleman a persistent storage. So everyone can read from it, uh, but as I told you, uh, the world is a result of state of quests, so only quests can write to it. And uh, after each change, uh, Persistent storage tries to uh, tries to propagate the change to objects, either if they are present at the time or when perhaps uh, when they are being spawned. Okay, so after we load uh, our quests, uh, we gather all objects uh, which are used anyway, uh, and we gather well, we ask all logics uh, about which properties of these objects are important to them. And we push all these informations into storage. And uh, storage analyzed the structure of our prefabs uh, in order to determine the initial state of these objects. And the results are stored in the storage, so everyone can uh, ask about them. And since our call stack uh, is able to roll back itself, uh, our storage needs to do the same. Uh, so to do this, we keep the whole history of changes uh, which you know, happens to each quest object. Yeah, we don't care about uh, other objects. Uh, each change in storage is marked with a timestamp, which is a simple counter which is incremented after uh, each change. And entries in call stack uh, remember what was the timestamp uh, when they were created. So when we trigger a rollback, we notify the storage you know, to, to which point it should roll back itself. Uh, yeah. A uh, very important thing is that we don't serialize the, uh, the persistent storage. 
yeah, it is the result of uh, the state of Quest. So when we load Quest, we recreate storage from the scratch. And this is probably the first conclusion after that part. Uh, yeah, we use storage uh, to store uh, the state of all objects, at least temporary, and it contains the whole history of all changes. Okay, yeah, good time. Uh, so, for me, the most important lesson learned uh, is the important of importance of proper uh, design. Uh, the time we spent on that uh, really paid off, and it made uh, the, the first months uh, uh, of work, you know, very easy. Uh, yeah. the, the new system is not some kind of a revelation. Uh, it is a direct evolution of problems and ideas from the, the previous system. Uh, and the thing I am most proud of is that we created one solution which handles all of our needs. So, thank you for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, I believe we have still time. Hey, thanks for um, a very interesting talk. I worked with a very similar internal tool for quite some time, so I have two questions. First of all, how many people can simultaneously work on one quest? Meaning, how do you uh, manage the conflicts? The second one is, um, we all know that nonlinear narrative can be literally a pain in the ass, and the more nonlinear it is, uh, the more the pain. Uh, so how do you guys uh, test it? Uh, do you have some automatic test it for like uh, beginning clause, end clause, and something like that? Thank you. Well, <laughs> these are very good questions. Uh, yeah, f so the first question is uh, how we deal uh, with multiple people working on a single quest. Uh, so for some time we had this approach that uh, we used exclusive checkouts uh, on files, and uh, each quest was uh, stored in a single file, so only one person was able to work on such quest. Uh, but, you know, in the reality of, for example, it read preparations or finishing game, uh, you can't work that way. Uh, so we removed that exclusive checkout, and yeah. Our requests are stored in XML files, so they are not great uh, to, to merge them. Uh, but we organized our graph, so we reduced the, ch the chance that two people uh, making modifications in the quest uh, you know, will be in conflict with each other. Uh, yeah, so we have some ability to merge uh, changes from uh, multiple uh, people. Uh, yeah. The second question was testing. testing. Okay, uh, so in Dying Light One we had these invokes, uh, which allowed us to to jump to you know any place in the in the story. Um, in Dying Light Two we also have invokes, uh, but unfortunately they are much more complicated because now we have graphs and you can uh, go through graph uh, in multiple ways. Um, So, <laughs> uh, it works, but it has its own problems. Uh, yeah, I don't think I could, you know, describe all the details. Uh, I also can t tell you that we are working uh, on some automated tests, but uh, yeah, that work is, is still in progress. Any other questions? Hi. Um, maybe as a quick follow-up question to the to the last one about automated testing. So you've mentioned you had pr um, problems when patching the game, basically. Uh, so what in in your like day-to-day -day work is it that you're doing to ensure that basically you can you can roll out a patch and not destroy any kind of safe games? Uh, during the development, uh, yeah, we don't patch our saves. 
Right. So okay. So that might be still like an open problem. If you make problem. safe one day, and if you uh, download a build next day, uh, the safe you know won't work. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> most of the time, we use invokes just to you know uh, quickly jump to a specific quest and to test it. Okay, but you're still like confident you can like uh, patch the game after release uh, going forward. Yes. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hey, so you said you are calling the um, execute callback on each quest, each frame. Uh, did it introduce any performance issues with some more complex logics? Uh, yes. <laughs> All right. So how do you do it? Um, I don't know what to say. Uh, hmm. The main problem is uh, when you have just too many logics at the same time. And uh, when they try to, you know, ask about the state of objects which are uh, despawned, so uh, it is fairly cheap to ask about the state of object which is present, but uh, yeah, it is expensive to ask about uh, the despawned objects. Um, yeah, but the performance of quests is not uh, really a big issue, you know. Uh, All right, great, thanks. Questions? Uh, hi. So um, you said that uh, uh, when you save the stack, um, is there a possibility that uh, the stack can grow like you know indefinitely? Uh, uh, no. So because you said there's actions that you can cancel, is it recorded into the stack? Because this, the size of the stack is not deterministic, right? Hmm. It's hard to predict what will be the size of the call stack, uh, mm -hmm. but it can't grow uh, into infinity. Uh, so, for example, in replication in Coop game, uh, we need to compress uh, these call stacks to send them uh, between players. Um, so to do that, we use uh, what is called reference call stack. So we simply generate, you know, a reference call stack uh, which which completes all paths in the graph, uh, and we use that to, for the compression. Um, so yeah, that call stack, uh, you know, is not that big really. Okay. So thanks. Anyone? Uh, hi, I have a quick question. Uh, you saw that any designer making quests can use the set variable to save the state of the current information he needs or he will need later on. And uh, with the multiple ways the quest can be created, there will be like really plenty of variables. Uh, and how do you handle uh, the naming of the variables? It, will the, another designer be able to know which vari variables to use? Do you have any guidelines for the designers to name the variables? Or doesn't that grow really <laughs> too big to, at the very end, like compare 20 variables to define if mm -hmm. this quest is finished or not, or if he should have a watch on his hand or not because okay. someone stole it like very early on? Uh, okay, uh, we have our main level designer here on the front row, so he could uh, answer the question better than I. Uh, <laughs> but our uh, variables are organized in a tree. Mm, so uh, the name of variable is the you know, concatenation of the names of all these levels. For example, the, the root level is called quests. Then you can uh, have uh, name of a quest and uh, last part is the name of uh, variable. Uh, so that way we avoided uh, conflicts between names. Yeah. Uh, for some time we wanted uh, to have uh, local variables uh, assigned to a uh, specific quest, but uh, yeah, we didn't do that. Uh, so our, our variables are global and 
each quest can uh, check variables from uh, each quest. And could you estimate how many variables do you have? I have no idea. Um, hundreds, probably, okay. at least. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, uh, I have a question about synchronizing when you play uh, with a co-op. Hmm? It's like, um, when I progress myself and then invite my friend, for example, uh, who didn't uh, done some quests, and of course he's almost similar award as mine with the decision, so his uh, call stack is almost the same, and then we make together a single quest, so he will overwrite uh, his word, or uh, it's like he cannot overwrite my f uh, call stack because you say something. No, like, uh, he will play in your call stack. Yeah, if you, and if you are the master. He, he cannot uh, do any changes to my call stack. For example, when there is a cr crucial decision, something to, with talk of an NPC, he cannot make a choose and let's say kill someone, and I don't want to do this. Uh, so this is perhaps. Uh, question about the design of the game, and I am probably not the best person to ask that question. Um, so, yeah. Okay, and <laughs> if he is able to override somehow his own call stack in, uh, let's say, my game, because he didn't make no, the quest, he, 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 he like won't mess with his own call stack. Okay, so when he will go back for a, so his single player, then he will be the same progress as he, he, he has. Yeah, okay, thanks. Okay. I think we end. Okay. So thank you again. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>